As for any competitor of a sporting competition, having some sort of entirely unique ability that an opponent does not can prove incredible competitive value. In combat robotics, this can come in the form of a self-riding ability to negate the KO power of a flip, a ground scraping forks to remove your opponent's control on the ground, or an irregular attack angle rarely armored against. Uh, the vast majority of robots use tank steer for drive, where the degrees of freedom are forward, back, uh, and turning left or right. Thus, if I could make a machine with more degrees of drivetrain freedom, I could outmaneuver an opponent in ways unexpected and thus unplanned for. This video covers how I went about developing my own omnidirectional combat robot, and how you can apply the learnings to your own project. Directional drivetrain is one where the number of drive control axes is equal to the number of available control axes. In our case, that's three. Uh, my robotics background comes mostly from FIRST Robotics, where omnidirectional drivetrains are actually somewhat common. The particular advantages there lie in more fluid alignment for placing a target or shooting at a target. Uh, but uh, in 2019, a team undeniably demonstrated to me the application for this type of drivetrain in defense avoidance. Robots can't attack each other in first competitions, but blocking or pushing is permitted. Uh, team 1323 Madtown Robotics applied their refined swerve drive to the field and it appeared quite unstoppable and eventually actually won the championship that year. A combination of their mechanically robust swerve modules, a well-tuned control system and a skilled driver meant that typical tank drive robots just couldn't keep up and much less slow them down. Uh, this was all on my mind when I went to conceptualize my own beta weight combat robot about a year later. A uh, true swerve drive is very difficult to implement at this scale due to the weight and complexity, but other omnidirectional drive trains do exist. The most common ones are Kilo variants, uh, Kiwi and X drive, uh, Mechanum drive, and H drive. Aside from a general reduction in traction, each, time ha each type has its own pros and cons and should be selected based on the desired characteristics. Omniwheels are a unique traction device designed to only impart force in their direction of rotation with no resistance to sideways mo movement, but permitted by radially placed rollers. This makes them very good approximations of vectors. For H-drive, forward, backward and turning is the same as tank, but a horizontal component can be attained by simply turning the wheel on the centre module. A combination of these allows for the full 3 degree of freedom control. H-drive is very simple to construct, it's very simple to control, uh, but the center module often interferes with the rest of the machine, like in how it's built, as well as generally requiring a minimum of five wheels. Uh, this makes for a bulletproof, but very heavy and very bulky solution. Kilo drives use at least three omni wheels placed radially. A combination of specific wheel velocities, thus specific vectors, can be summed to a resulting translation and rotation vector for the whole robot. These drives can use any number of wheels greater than three, but very rarely is it more than four. For our interests, the Kiwi variant is the most interesting. With simple trigonometry, all three axes of control can be obtained from a uniquely low three wheels. Less wheels means less weight and less complexity in theory, but this is often offset by requiring a uniquely constructed frame to handle the odd angles the wheels are placed at, as well as heavy restrictions on the rest of the robot's construction. Available space that's not taken up by those wheels is made out of unusual non-rectangular shapes which common components like a battery don't fit nicely in. X-Drive uh, is the four-wheel variant, but has little advantages over the most common last option for us, which is Mechanum Drive. This drive uses unique omni-wheels with rollers set at 45 degrees. This makes them very similar to a four-wheel X-Drive, but with the added benefit of greater forward and backward speed like a tank drive, and a similar frame construction. Such top speed differential can be advantageous or not depending on how critical matching the motor speed to the ground speed is.
and selecting for a combat robot specifically, all of these options have existing examples that I'm aware of bar H drive. No matter which option is chosen, some common deficiencies are pretty much unavoidable. The Omni wheels are weaker than standard wheels to shock loading, to static loading and debris resistance because of the really small rollers. Typical wheels have greater traction and therefore more pushing power and acceleration. Any Omni drive is going to have more than two control actuators and therefore that's more weight in hardware and electronics and also in complexity of the control system. And finally, Omni drive robots need to be about as long as wide typically for a balanced control as well as even weight distribution across each wheel to ensure their influence is as close to the mass as possible as each of the wheel acts as a vector. This may seem a bit of a downer, um, but that's the cost of gaining the potential omnidirectional drivetrain edge, um, and we just need to be aware of those deficiencies to properly tackle them. When looking for inspiration for my own machine, I stumbled upon this photo in the Riobots combat tutorial document. It depicts a unnamed robot with a three-wheel kilo drive in a two-piece clamshell chassis, fronted by a hub motor egg beater weapon. This machine is invertible, it has protected wheels, it has a decent looking weapon, and provides a solution to the complex chassis problem with those two assumedly machined pieces. The three-wheel kilo is also the lightest of the considered Omni drives, so I chose that it was the best basic concept to move forward. At the time of conception, uh, which was about June 2020, my resources were pretty limited on making a 1.36 kilogram beetle weight robot. Uh, these are a lot bigger and more expensive than the 150 gram ant weights that I was used to, and so it was worth constructing the robot around what was cheap and available. The first three drive modules were based around Robert Cohen's brushless beetle drive video, uh, attached to very cheap 38mm Omni wheels from China. Uh, and these came with their own brass hubs in the box, so that was also helpful. The weapon could just about be made from a very large bolt that I had lying around. The chassis would be machined out of three 10mm HDPE plates on a 6040 router that I had access to. I didn't have the skills for multi-setup machining at the time, and not really a good idea on how to control cut depth accurately for 2.5D features. Uh, so aside from reducing the cost, the three plates made it easy to have differing features on the top of the robot the middle of the robot and the bottom of the robot. Uh, miscellaneous parts will be made from 3mm aluminium plate because that was very cheap. The initial CAD concept was laid out, including my first concept for a hub motor weapon, which I still use derivatives of today. Uh, idea one was to basically copy the rear bot's picture uh, with a drone motor on one side and a bearing support on the other. Uh, with hindsight, this was never going to hold up to a combat robot setting at all, uh, at beta weight scale at least. And so with some other builder's advice, I arrived on close to the final version. This uses a dedicated uh, dead axle with two ball bearings um, and a cut-up drone motor on one side to allow the magnet ring to be embedded in the drum separate from the stator. Around this time, I realized that it would look really, really cool to have the drivetrain motors be the same ones as the weapon motor and have them stick out the top and bottom in cutouts. It's not a very good decision competitively, uh, but it's not one I regret either. Uh, it looks very sick. Uh, the really big motors help drive later on, and they actually haven't been hit um, in the time I've been competing them at all. Uh, this also included a move to 25mm Chinese spur gearboxes, also quite affordable. I spent a good six months or so continually tweaking the CAD, uh, as there was plenty of time during the pandemic. After just, just a few versions, it was good enough to start manufacturing. Some parts I could make myself, such as the gear motors, uh, the chassis bits, um, but others I had made by a local machinist, including the drum, axle, and all the aluminium parts. As I was still in school and had access to the TAFE areas, I bent the aluminium panels with the magna bender and tried to polish the chatter off the HDPE uh, with a buffing wheel. It took a while to nail the drive mixing, but eventually got a consistent translation out of it. What I didn't know at the time, and only found out about two years later, was that the signal center point of the ESCs didn't match the center point of the radio. So each of the drive motors tended to bias more forward than it did reverse, which meant the robot actually preferred to translate right than did left, as it was more consistent, it was straighter. A uh, bit of a weird one, but eventually sorted that out. Uh, the drum was assembled, it was attached to the robot, and I got to start hitting things.
I had no reference for what was good for a beetle weight, as I'd never actually been to an event before. Uh, but it seemed to throw aluminium things around pretty far, so I called that good enough. Uh, the drive motors were rubbing quite badly on the LiPo battery, which necessitated some 3D printed retainers to keep the cell off of the motor cans, as well as removing the casing of the battery to shrink it effectively. Wiring was condensed so that the lid could be put on, and the machine was ready to compete. Scale had its first fight in Melbourne at my first event. Um, it was up against a durable drum spinner named Bucktooth first, with a TPU and HDPE chassis. Scale's drum struggled to get any purchase on the rubbery chassis, and was pretty much just mulked by Bucktooth for a good while, until it eventually fell into it. It was a pretty brutal first match. Um, despite the beating, Scale was still fully functional when it ended the match. An immediate takeaway was that the drum it didn't bite plastic swell at all, nor had the tip speed to outpace Bucktooth's drum. Uh, the second fight was against a two-wheel drive uh, Fingertech egg beater, uh, with Scale actually getting some good hits in this time, attempting to side strafe its opponent. While it wasn't very fast, it was able to keep its opponent on its feet by continually moving towards their side. Eventually, a hit knocked Scale back, and it just died. Turns out the power switch that I'd made from a screw and two copper plates had an intermittent contact issue and just about turned off uh, when it got hit. Poking the switch, just tapping it to turn, to turn back on, so pretty much at that exact moment I vowed to use proven off-the-shelf parts for something so critical as a power switch um, and not to bother with making my own again, just to save a few dollars. With two losses, Scale was out of the competition, so it got extra time to mull over its performance. An immediate takeaway of mine was that the machine had taken practically zero damage, aside from some armor bolt bolts pulling out, so a good sign for a traditionally fragile drivetrain. A power switch failure is an obvious point for improvement alongside my driving, um, but it was also evident that the drum didn't have the capacity to do any real damage. It was outsped by Bucktooth, and even with a good hit uh, on the other machine, it didn't have any real effect. I wanted to rebuild scale right then and there after that event, um, but decided to give it a proper send-off uh, at the largest ant and beetle event in the country, ARC Robot Havoc. For this event, the only work I did on scale was to replace the power switch with a finger tech screw switch, and so I had low expectations based on the performance at the previous event. Uh, the first match was against Killicorn, a pretty indestructible four-wheel drive pusher. The drum was quite effective at getting under the Killicorn, which allowed scale to push them around. I had no chance of doing any real damage. Um, and unfortunately the drum was also very effective at ingesting the tail which jammed up the drum. After a couple of cyclic reversing attempts, it eventually came out and was back to pushing around, aiming for the pit. Uh, while not the most action-packed fight, the slow pace does a good job of showing some of the potential in holonomic drive. As much as possible, I was able to keep killer corn between scale and the pit, while also keeping the drum faced at them at, in case there was an opportunity to push. The match ended in a draw, uh, which was the best result to date. The second match was against Antidoser, another bricky pusher. Uh, with something, without something to get the drum under like Killicorn, I figured my best chance was to aim for a full three minute fight and take the draw rather than risk a pitting. Scale with no pushing power on Antidoser and without an effective drum, it was a real careful match. Again, not a super interesting fight, but it demonstrates the control available with this unique drivetrain. No matter what, I was able to keep the drum facing the opponent, while also keeping them between me and the pit. Uh, the fight eventually ended in a draw. The third matchup was to fight a two-wheel drive vertical spinner named Lumberjack. This was quite a concerning matchup, as it could do some real damage to my machine. I drove Scal fairly aggressively, same to the sides of Lumberjack, whilst directing them towards the pit as much as possible. Due to my drum being so much smaller than their spinner, I was actually able to pop their weapon up probably the biggest hit this version of scale has ever made. Again, using the on drive to keep the position optimal, eventually scale got its first win. First of this face. To bring things back down to earth, the fourth, fourth match was a rematch against Bucktooth. Not much to say about this one other than I was able to just about be under its drum with my own, and was eventually bumped over the lower arena for a loss. At this point, the tooth on the titanium drum had become very worn 
so I elected to run the robot upside down for the rest of the event, with the drum spinning backwards uh, with the fresh side of the tooth being used to hit. Moving on to the finals, Scale had a rematch against Killer Corn. Things went a lot better with the fresh tooth in my day of driving practice. I'd remove the armor to keep the drum as forward as possible to attempt to get some sort of bite, um, and it was getting under Killer Corn pretty reliably. The Omni Drive helped as usual, saving it from some potentially pretty gnarly situations, such as this one, when I could just about direct Scale into the wall and try to push its way out, rather than having to either fight them in reverse or take my fate and go into the pit. Eventually, after a lot of shoving, Scale actually managed to win this match. Now in the semi-finals, we are up against Annie RUAK. Annie is an undercutter built by Ben, and I knew I had to keep it from spinning up if I wanted a chance and not taking significant damage. I was initially able to keep on them, but completely unable to do anything with that advantage due to the ineffectual drum. Eventually Annie got spun up, and I was unable to remove them up enough energy from their weapon to get things back to the pushy stage. Um, so Scale started taking a lot of damage, um, and ended with heaps of damage by the end of the fight completely ruining the aluminium armour plates and one of the Omni wheels, also back driving a gearbox which sheared the pinion off one of the drive motors. More critically, the drum had been smashed in, with the corner near the motor bent and jamming on the stator. Uh, this meant that Scale was going into the third place playoffs with no weapon, uh, with no ground game or any real means of pushing against a very scoopy opponent. In this fight, it becomes apparent just how small Scale actually is. My objective was to keep them between me and the pit at all times while trying to show some aggression in this match, uh, as it was judged. Even with a run-up, Scale wasn't able to nudge Choppy at all, um, but right about here, I realised that I actually had a chance. Scale was so small, it could slip under Choppy's wedge, where it mounts to the chassis. Uh, with the Omni Drive, I was able to manoeuvre sideways under it, and with the added adhesion this gave me, I could push Choppy down the pit in third place. Um, and that's the end for Scale Mark 1, it was pretty wrecked, um, but it did win third place at Robot Havoc 5. A pretty good result for a robot uh, which had a lot of mistakes. Um, there were some key things to improve for version 2. I needed a much more effectual weapon. I needed a faster drive to man maintain that positional advantage. A true unibody chassis uh, to save some weight and increase the strength. Um, and to do away with the aluminium armour for a pure HDPE machine. Um, and also make it just more repairable for fixes on the day. The most salient point here is the weapon. Scale Mark 1 was underweight by 300 grams out of the 1.36 kilograms allotted. Um, this is absolutely massive as a typical egg beater weapon um, only weighs about 150 grams. So there was all the space in the world to improve things. The drum was so small um, to keep it invertible, but for reckon for version 2, do away with that um, in order to effectively combat opponents rather than relying on just being the last one to fall into the pit. Uh, and that's about where this video ends, um, but fear not, dear viewer, as Scale Mark II is not only finished but has also competed at this year's Robot Havoc. With the Omni Drive nailed, uh, the next video will go over Mark II with its custom drive gearboxes, its unibody chassis, and a pretty devastating egg beater drum. Until next time.